Brazil, a word that conjures up images of beaches, carnival, music, and football. A nation with more World Cup wins than any other, one which has spread the gospel of Ojogo Bonito around the world. Their World Cup winning teams of 1958 and 1962 laid the foundations of a football dynasty and restored a nation's pride. The Cup of 1950 was supposed to herald a new era for Brazil, a coming of age for a country that felt inferior to its European and American counterparts. As Europe counted the cost of the Second World War, South America was left relatively unscathed. And with new stadia and a new infrastructure, this was Brazil's time to shine. The team delivered and in the final required only a draw to win the trophy. Everyone thought Brazil would destroy Uruguay. We were the big favorites. Uruguay, however, had not read the script. He shot. Goal to Uruguay. Go for Uruguay. It was only then I realized Brazil were losing the World Cup. It was an incredible silence. I said at the time that I was able to hear silence. Silence has the sound of tears, the women crying, even the men were sobbing, and we could hear it. It was so bitter, a silence that swept everything else away. And it lasted a long time. 2-1 defeat, the so-called Maracanazo, devastated Brazilian confidence on and off the pitch. It's a date that we can't escape from, like a branding iron that has left a burning mark on a cow. Brazil didn't play again for two years, and another four before they returned to the Maracanã. And so superstitious were the Brazilians, they even changed the color of their shirts from white to yellow. The 1954 World Cup brought a quarter-final defeat at the hands of Hungary. Four years later, the selectors made a significant and inspired decision, calling up a young striker who just joined Santos, Pelé. I wasn't surprised as he already stood out at Santos. In 1957, he'd already shown what a fantastic player he was going to be. Pelé wasn't discovered in 1958. He was simply discovered by the rest of the world in 1958. But here in Brazil, he was already very highly regarded for a young player. And he had a great future ahead of him. But as the team departed for Sweden, expectations were far from high. Many of the fans at home did not believe in the team, and perhaps that was why the team played in a calm manner. It played with a certain tranquility because we didn't have any responsibilities. Also included in the squad was a 24-year-old Botafogo winger, Mane Garincha, the darling of the Maracanã, with a unique body shape and one leg longer than the other. Nicknamed the Angel with the Bent Legs, he brought a childlike joy to the pitch. His skills were not in doubt, but some perceived a lack of maturity in his conduct on and off the pitch. Garincha had been dropped from the team after a warm-up game against Fiorentina. He scored a beautiful goal, dribbling past two or three defenders, then stopped the ball on the goal line before backheeling it in. The backroom staff didn't think he was mentally prepared to play in a World Cup after that. They thought, here's a guy who's very humble and a bit of a loose cannon. 
Uh, is he going to do the same thing in the World Cup? They saw it as irresponsible, but he knew it was just a friendly, and the World Cup would be different. This World Cup would be different for Brazil in many ways. The backroom staff was comprehensive, comprising a trainer, supervisor, administrator, treasurer, doctor, and even a dentist. The medical staff conducted rigorous checks and were horrified to find most of the players in terrible health. I think that Brazil were quite keen on organization. And so the group of directors at the time organized everything in a spectacular manner. We got the team together six months before, but not just to train, but to verify the fitness of the players. There were players that had some bad teeth that needed removing, stuff like that. There were players that were receiving treatment for knee pain. The team's doctor, Hilton Gosling, traveled to Sweden the year before the tournament, assessing various training bases and hotels across the host cities. Off the pitch, nothing was left to chance. On it, England, the Soviet Union and Austria would provide the group opposition. The selectors headed by Vicente Feola played safe for the opening match. With Pelé injured, Garincha was not named in the starting 11. Despite this, Brazil began their campaign by defeating the Austrians 3-0, with two goals from Altafini and a third from Nilton Santos. The pitch was a potato field. It was very bumpy, but we were good that day. I scored the opening goal from a shot from Zagallo, and I also scored the third goal after one from Didi. A battling one-all draw with England meant that progression into the next round hinged on the game against the Soviet Union. The Soviets were fancied by many to do well after their victory in the 1956 Olympics. For Brazil, Garincha and Pelé had both impressed in training, and the Brazilian selectors played their trump cards. The third game against the Soviet Union was when both Garincha and Pele started for us. And Brazil suddenly got even better. Zito also came in then as the side was starting to evolve. The two of them started against the USSR and they performed spectacularly. It was a team that had really improved with every game and we got stronger and stronger. Garincha terrorized the Soviets from the outset, and Vava scored the first of his two goals after just three minutes. He had a memorable game. The two of them, him and Pele, defeated the Soviets that day. After we beat Russia, we knew we had a chance to win the tournament, and our confidence began to rise. A 1-0 victory over Wales further enhanced that belief. Pelé and Garincha retained their places in the starting 11 and continued to impress. At the time, many journalists were writing, Pelé's just a 17-year-old kid. And look at all the responsibility he's been given. What must he be thinking? And I thought, my God. But in the national team, I didn't have much responsibility, really. That lay with Nilton Santos and Didi, Bellini, the older, more experienced players. But for me, at that time, well, I was just living my dream. I had no worries at all. I just wanted to play. The 17-year-old played a starring role to set up a semi-final against yet another European powerhouse. We faced France and they were a goal-scoring machine because Jules Fontaine was the top marksman of that side and of the whole championship. People always ask me which was the best Brazil side I ever played in. Was it the team from 1958 or 62, 1966 or 1970? Obviously, the teams from 1958 and 1970 both won the World Cup. So those are the two sides everyone likes to compare. I've always said that both teams were really good, very strong. But I think the 1958 Brazil side was, individually speaking, better than the 1970 team. 
nós conquistamos jogando um futebol. We were playing a really good brand of fluid football. Ball, touch and artistry. O futebol foi maravilhoso. It was incredible and hadn't been seen before. Só aqueles que estavam Only those who were in the stadiums in Sweden could bear witness to this incredible, exciting brand of football Brazil played. Futebol de alto nível. In a 5-2 win, Pelé's hat-trick grabbed the headlines, but Didi scored the pick of the goals. I'd say that the most important player of that time was... It was probably Didi, because even though Didi was not the captain of the team, that was Bellini, Didi was the playmaker of the side. Forgoing the WM formation employed by most teams, coach Vicente Feola initiated a new 4-2-4 system that was designed to get the best from his attacking players. In 1958, we had Gilmar, who was one of the best goalkeepers in the world back then. We had Didi, one of the best central midfielders in the world. We had Garincha and Vava, who was the best striker around back then. We even had Nilton Santos, the best left-sided player to have ever appeared in South America. So individually, it was the best national team we ever had, without any doubt at all. Brazil were through to a second World Cup final, but the spectre of 1950 remained. Sweden were at home and had already beaten some good teams on their way to the final. The 29th of June 1958, Brazil's date with destiny. On the day, it actually rained for a while, which left us a little nervous as we knew the Europeans were better at playing on a wet surface. We got a real scare when they scored their first goal. I was replaying in my mind the video of 1950, Brazil against Uruguay in the Maracanã. When we'd lost, and I thought, are we really going to have to lose again? Brazilians everywhere feared the worst. I was on the bench, and I had a director from our team next to me. And when we conceded, he started crying, and we all just tried to console him and calm him. But he says it will be just like 1950. But those on the pitch would not be denied. Vava led the way with two first-half goals before an act of teenage impudence by Pelé that is still talked about today. The 1958 World Cup was the first time the Europeans had ever seen a trick, which we called the hat in Brazil. Back then, the Europeans had never seen anything like it, and we brought it with us from Brazil. Zagallo and Pelé again clinched a 5-2 victory for Brazil. In Sweden, it was our first World Cup win. It was incredible, marvellous, just one big party. We were all shouting and celebrating, and the King of Sweden came onto the pitch to congratulate us all. And I just wanted to speak to my mum and dad and tell them that the King had shaken my hand and that we'd won the World Cup. And the funny thing is that I went to change into my clothes with Pepe and then got lost in the city. I was lost. I was looking everywhere for Pepe, couldn't find him, and then went back and slept. So I couldn't have fun or celebrate. I never celebrated that first World Cup. There were celebrations aplenty in Brazil, though. The ghost of 1950 had been laid to rest. The homecoming proved as much when the team eventually made it back to Rio via Paris, Lisbon and Recife. The arrival of the trophy Brazil had so long coveted, sparking jubilation all over this vast country. After Rio, we then had to go to Sao Paulo. We arrived in our hotel at 5 a.m. and then at 7 a.m. we had to get on a flight to Sao Paulo. Obviously, at Sao Paulo, there was another procession from the airport to the stadium. 
Pelé and Garincha had now become bona fide superstars, and their respective clubs wasted no time in cashing in on their fame. Both Santos and Botafogo embarked on worldwide tours, earning fortunes, enabling each to keep hold of their stars. But it wasn't just Pelé and Garincha who could play. Santos boasted Zito, Gilmar, Pepe, Mauro, Mengalvio and Cuccino, whilst the Rio club Botafogo had Milton Santos, Didi, Amarildo and Mario Zagallo. Botafogo was a great club back then. In the 60s, the two best teams were Santos and Botafogo. Santos were a little better. A little better. That Brazil team was effectively made up from two club sides, half Santos and half Botafogo. And that gives you an idea of just how good Santos were. We spent a lot of time playing together. In Brazil's first match of the 1962 World Cup, eight of the starting 11 played for either Botafogo or Santos, whose strength was outlined when they lifted the 1962 Intercontinental Cup, a title they retained, confirming their status as the world's strongest club side. Apart from Pele, they had some great players. They had Zito. He was the Santos captain, and in the Brazilian national side, he was the real captain. He would argue with everyone, meaning that he wasn't that big, but he had a big mouth. I was horrible and very demanding. I really was. But it seemed to work. Zito was one of 11 players in Brazil's first World Cup winning squad who traveled to Chile to defend their title four years later. In 62, Brazil arrived as favorites. The rest of the world discovered us in 58. So we arrived in Chile as world champions, but we had the same staff, the same mentality, and the same ability. The tournament was shaping up to be Pelé's coronation, the greatest player in the world on his home continent, leading his team to glory. And he began well, scoring in the opening win against Mexico. But in the following match against Czechoslovakia, Pelé limped off with a groin strain. His World Cup was over. For, for this as you can well imagine, it was really difficult being without our most important player in the team at the World Cup finals. Because whether you like it or not, Pele was the star of that team. And Brazilian football placed all its hopes on him, him and Garincha. Pele got injured. There was no way of doing tests on him back then, so he was out of the World Cup. Amarildo took his place. I was confident in my own ability. It wasn't that I was as good as Pelé, but I knew that I could produce the goods on the pitch and play to the best of my abilities. I remember Nilton Santos saying to me, kid, don't think you're playing for Brazil. Just think that you're playing for Botafogo. Look who's playing alongside you. Me, Zagallo, Garincha and Didi. There's five of us. So play like you do for Botafogo and forget Brazil. His first game in that World Cup was against Spain. And to start with, he wasn't playing that well. So some of the players in the team started to get at him a little. The likes of Zito came down a little heavy on him, just to get him going. And fortunately, he exploded into action after that. I knew that it would be a definitive game. Either us or Spain would go through. And we won 2-1, and I scored both goals, which was a great reward for all the work we'd put into that game. I think it was a great victory. To beat a national team who could easily have won the World Cup that year. 
We looked to Garincha when things weren't going well, both in 62 and 58. Milton Santos would shout, give the ball to Mane, and Garincha would get the ball, dribble down the wing, and then cut it back for either Vava or Pele, who'd usually score. Garincha demonstrated his full range of skills against a strong England team, scoring twice as Brazil ran out 3-1 winners. He was like having an extra weapon in your armory. He played phenomenally against England, and they were a good team. But to have stopped Garincha that day, they'd have needed a machine gun. On the pitch, he could destroy any fullback he faced. He could go past two or three players at a time. Just a fantastic dribbler. He's the only player who is loved by every single fan from every single club in Brazil. Garincha doesn't belong to any one club. Every club in Brazil supported Garincha. He was the joy of the people, as they used to say. Because when Garincha played, it even entertained the opposition. He was incredible. I don't think you could ever get another player like Garincha. Against the hosts in the semi-final, Garincha's good form continued. He opened the scoring after nine minutes, before adding a second just after the half hour. And despite the hostility of the partisan crowd, Brazil eventually defeated Chile 4-2. Though the victory, it seemed, had come at a price. Garincha had been sent off in the 83rd minute after retaliating to Chilean aggression and to add insult to injury was struck by a bottle thrown from the crowd as he walked from the field. To the enormous relief of millions of Brazilians, he was cleared to play in the final. With an injured Pelé watching on, Brazil went one down to Czechoslovakia after just 15 minutes, but equalised almost immediately through Amarildo. Then in the 70th minute, Zito's moment of glory. It was the winning goal. And it was funny. I was near Mauro at the back. And when I started to run, I shouted, pass it, pass it. And Mauro passed me the ball. Amarildo was running down the left wing, and I passed it to Amarildo. Pass it, pass it, I shouted. <laughs> and right at the top end of the pitch, I shouted, pass it, again. And he crossed the ball. I jumped up on my own and scored with my head. The best goal of my life was that one. <laughs> it gave us our second World Cup. Garincha won that World Cup for Brazil. In that tournament, he scored from a free kick. He dribbled like he always did. He scored with his head. He even scored with his left foot. He was inspired in that World Cup. I think an angel was watching over him. He carried Brazil by himself. Vava sealed a 3-1 victory and in doing so matched the five-goal haul of the team's talisman, Garincha. There's something that I'd like every football fan to know. Myself and Garincha played in the national team together for around 12 years, from 1958 onwards, until Garincha passed away. And when we did play together for Brazil, we never lost a single game. We were unbeaten. Unbeaten, perhaps, but both they and Brazil struggled at the next World Cup in England. Four years later, however, Pelé inspired Brazil to glory in Mexico, winning the Jury May Trophy for a third time. In 2012, Pelé returned to the scene of his coming of age. Former teammates and opponents gathered in Gothenburg's Rasunda Stadium to remember that day in 1958 when Brazil cast a spell upon football fans the world over. Having passed away in 1983, Garincha was sorely missed. If Pelé is renowned as Brazil's greatest ever player, Garincha, the joy of the people, remains the most loved.
His name now adorns Brasilia's World Cup stadium, and he'll forever be revered for erasing the pain of 1950, alongside the other greats of his generation. For those teams of 1958 and 1962, their legacy looms large, setting Brazil on the road to becoming the planet's greatest football nation.